Dale Diaz in biomedical engineering from Virginia Commonwealth University and a master's of engineering management from, from Duke University. He is focused on improving process automation technology for, uh, for a better future. And with that, I'll turn the uh, away over to them. So, as Mark mentioned, I'm the product portfolio manager for your firm, Schneider Electric in North America. Um, just want to give you a little background. Uh, this is my first MP. Uh, amazing to hear the last two talks. Very technical as far as the mechanical instrumentation and uh, you know, uh, new innovations that are coming from that end. Uh, my goal today is to kind of bring you guys uh, a little bit more uh, of the idea behind the control systems that uh, when you know, present a mechanical system or something's built, such as uh, Tom's last presentation, uh, how you can improve the uh, throughput, um, you know, process yield, uh, energy efficiency, things of that nature, when your constraints are already built with that uh, you know, mechanical build there. Um, so, uh, certainly plastics uh, for us is, is one of our uh, focuses, uh, but we do, uh, as a process automation uh, focus, delve into other industries, and so we try to take that learning uh, across our applications and build them into solutions for uh, different groups such as plastics. So, uh, hopefully you'll, you'll learn a little bit more about how we approach kind of advanced control systems from uh, an analog standpoint, but then even further uh, by moving into uh, a full system build for a full extrusion process. Uh, so we'll just take a, a look at very basic, because um, uh, I want to highlight kind of a lot of the optimization points that we can look at uh, as far as controlling because uh, obviously there are tons of different uh, types of polymers, right? All these different variables in the equation to get to the end product. Um, but it's all about how can we isolate those variables uh, and control them uh, so that uh, when they're affecting each other uh, in the chain of process, uh, how easy it is to go back and forth, react to disturbances, uh, things of that nature, um, more so into the advanced control portion. Uh, and also, how we can move forward, obviously, uh, you know, industry 4.0, uh, factory 4.0, industrial internet of things. Uh, these are you know, some buzzwords that uh, have come up, but really it's all about uh, making use of the data available to us, whether it's real time uh, or uh, recording that data over time, using it as a, a quality standard. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how we can sort of leverage uh, the data available to us from uh, these types of systems. Okay, so uh, just just to get a quick overview, um, just wanted to get a couple of uh, potential products. Obviously, there's tons of things on the floor you'll see this whole week. Uh, this is the large show I've been to, um, but you know, multiple uh, different types of end solutions that you're looking at uh, as far as different extrusion processes. Um, so we'll go through a couple of those uh, just to highlight from the very basic side. Um, so right, we've got. Uh, your, your basic profile, right, long extrusion, um, pretty much a subset of uh, what you're going to be talking about as far as the base and then building on top of it. Uh, so I'm sure uh, this is kind of where everything started and then uh, improvements were made, uh, modifications to produce different things like cable coding, right? Uh, you have large companies, coaxial cable, uh, easy example like DAC, telephone wire, um, all these different types of end product. And of course, uh, blown film is actually a huge uh, thing set up now for far from Mars uh, with blown film extrusion. Um, so uh, obviously there are lots of different types uh, with lots of different products involved. Uh, this is your basic extrusion diagram, right? Everyone's kind of familiar, or hopefully I guess it should be probably from a base level. Um, we saw in the, in the previous presentation the hopper, uh, whether you get it from Home Depot uh, or it's your you know, typically built out um, specialized uh, for the resin that you're working with. But essentially, you have all your barrels, right? You have different zones, uh, which may contain uh, different temperature profiles, right? The point is, you want to get to the end where the die is to produce uh, your end product and extrude uh, through the whole system. So, um, what do we have here, right? The variables we're working with, mostly pressure. Uh, probably the most critical uh, variables in a basic extrusion application are pressure, uh, melt pressure and melt temperature. Right? However, temperature, of course, uh, is felt throughout the system, uh, and generally using this to build up to your, your endpoint pressure uh, according to the polymer type that you're using. So, uh, how are these things controlled? Generally, uh, the screw right, is the integral part. Uh, I'm sure uh, you get a lot from uh, in 
Mark, I think, has the expertise here as far as simple screw systems. But uh, obviously, that has a huge dependency upon the temperature and the pressure, uh, shear forces, right, and just general as you're processing, uh, building up uh, using heating and or cooling applications in each part uh, of the extrusion barrel. Uh, as we move on, right, a little bit more uh, onto the end of the process, right, so you're, you're adding on uh, different uh, dependencies for uh, cast film, right, so here I just want to highlight uh, where you're seeing the variables too, and obviously you're uh, working with lots of nip rollers uh, to work with the characteristics of the material. Uh, and along those points, of course, you have uh, tons of variables that are working with and against each other, right? So the whole time your system is moving along, uh, you know, depending on uh, reactions in the system, uh, you know, uh, part of the polymer, you get a bad batch of resin uh, that affects, uh, you know, on down the chain. So there's all this feedback and motion coming through uh, at the same time, which you have to account for, right? And, and generally, uh, depending on the type of level and the type of tolerances you're working towards, from a quality standpoint, uh, are going to dictate where um, your uh, your tolerances or your quality levels and precision and accuracy within the uh, extrusion applications uh, are going to come. So, as you can see, right, multiple points. Uh, so, if any one of these points goes uh, haywire, or uh, the control comes out of its 10% range, 5% range, whatever it is, the temperature comes out. Uh, obviously, another factor in here uh, it's going to affect all the other variables in the chain. So, what you want to do to mitigate those changes uh, that can obviously have residual effects down the line uh, is to control those or at least react to them uh, in the form of control, right? So in this, in this kind of setup, you've already uh, been working with uh, the mechanical components are in place, uh, your constraints are there, now you have to work with those in order to produce uh, the, the best uh, possible product, uh, you know, the highest output rates, et cetera, et cetera. A uh, similar example with uh, blown film, obviously the characteristics are gonna be a little bit different but the same kind of idea. Uh, your drive speed is going to be dictated by certain controllers here and there, which are affected by uh, other processes uh, before, but then also afterwards, because the whole time the polymer is being extruded, uh, of course it's connected, right? It's, it's all part of the same spot. So in order to meet um, kind of the continuity, obviously you need to have those speeds match up throughout the process. And again, right, temperature. Most of the work in the, in, in the barrel here, the, the post-processing temperature, generally we're looking at cooling, which isn't as critical a factor. Uh, so certainly it matters, but uh, isn't the most critical uh, in the base set of applications. Of course, uh, you can get into kind of higher level applications where uh, post-processing uh, is huge. And now, uh, as you heard, uh, added to manufacturing because you're adding a layer when you're uh, color shooting, uh, kind of in that sense, uh, they're obviously all uh, the, the variables involved when those two processes are coming together. So, things to keep in mind as we look at, right? So, uh, how do we optimize these things from a control perspective? Um, obviously, the starting point is the mechanical construction and design, uh, right, of, your, of the screw type, depending on the resin material you're working with. Whatever the application is, you're building towards that uh, first and foremost, right? And then from there, uh, you'll be uh, building on to, uh, you know, what, what are the different things we can do with this model? What are the different applications we can use, or is it a very small subset this uh, you know, extended product could be used for uh, in the market? Uh, so after that, uh, after after your whole installation is in place, uh, instrumentation is a key factor and something that you can um, use, right? Because uh, there's no way to see into the process uh, at any point in time unless you have some some form sort of uh, indicator, right? Thermocouple. Uh, which is pressure transducer, melt pressure, melt temperature, right? Some of the most critical components. Um, uh, you know, you get some buildup, and uh, there's uh, pressure buildup. Obviously, you don't want the extruder blowing up to be your indicator that something is going wrong, right? So, instrumentation is critical for uh, reading all the different variables uh, so that you can react, but also just as an indicator for safety. Of course, there are different safety measures um, for breaker plates and, and physical constraints. However, uh, it's, it's certainly something that can be used to uh, mitigate those kind of disastrous scenarios, but also uh, be that window into uh, the process at any point in time, or uh, going forward if you're, of course, reporting all that information together. Uh, the next part, uh, certainly, in, in, uh, what is really, uh, it's, it's what you're doing with the information that you've gathered from that window into the process at that specific point in time, but also 
uh, how we were using it to uh, improve the process uh, moving forward. So how do we how do we do these things, right? So at, at Eurotherm and Shiner Electric, uh, we kind of pride ourselves on the, uh, the analog control response, right, which is uh, more to do with uh, three key components of how well are you actually reading uh, the variable you're reading, uh, and how are you responding to it, and is that response and reading uh, continuous over time, right? So, uh, you know, an electrical characteristic um, of thermal drift, uh, over time, uh, gradually electrical components degrade or uh, something changes to where uh, they're not performing to their to their spec uh, and falling out of it. So, you know, for instance, if I'm actually reading 150 degrees, I want to know that that 150 degrees is matched to what I'm controlling to. So, uh, in a typical uh, logic controller, it's uh, a little bit less of uh, a priority, uh, which is how and, and why analog uh, and typical uh, PID controllers are used to respond to these types of variable changes and obviously control them. Uh, so on top of those, uh, PID is generally uh, just a, a theory based on the error from the set point you're trying to reach uh, to uh, the actual process value or variable, the PV. Right? And so uh, generally, the PID uh, theory, there's a couple different ways of looking at it, but it's a, a simple set uh, of algorithms uh, based on the difference uh, or the, the change uh, in the difference at any point in time uh, or from point to point in time. Uh, but on top of those things, uh, what you can develop are uh, ways to mitigate um, uh, discrepancies in the PID response of, uh, of a certain cases. Right? So if there's a disturbance to a system, the system is starting up, uh, things like that. There are certain things you can do in the control algorithms uh, to uh, enhance the control uh, and save on the total energy input to the system, right? If you have a heating and cooling system, you don't want the heating to be uh, fighting the cooling the whole time. Likewise, uh, a drive system, uh, right, if you're trying to control melt pressure, uh, you don't want the uh, drive speed to be increasing and the temperature to be increasing at the same time. Obviously, uh, they're related to one another, so uh, having both sets of information at the same time in order to uh, maintain that the control response is critical to the process. And then of course, uh, afterwards, there's a, uh, a certain uh, putting all the information together um, in a more complex fashion, right? So you can have your basic uh, single loop. Uh, you know, I care about each barrel zone, uh, each adapter zone, of course, the die zone, the melt pressure uh, at any single point in time. However, also concerned with how each one, as I mentioned before, is going to affect uh, it in that course of action. So uh, being able to tie those variables together, whether in an isolated system uh, or a fully networked uh, operation, uh, can be a way to enhance the process uh, and mitigate those uh, kind of takeoff risks, which can be critical uh, to safety, but also uh, to quality, right? So uh, that connectivity factor, which we'll get into here in a bit, is uh, the next level component of how do I know that this extruder is working well compared to the extruders down the line compared to the one that's working you know, across the country. Um, so things to keep in mind are the, the PID control response in general. Um, so you want the accuracy of your input reading to be there uh, as well as the control response as, as far as the algorithms controlling uh, the output rate to control those variables. Uh, pressure, temperature, uh, you know, flow in some instances, uh, whatever variable it is, right? Uh, and so just to highlight, um, of course, all the area up under the curve, right, is energy expense. And uh, you can tell on the graph here, right, I want to get to temperature uh, or pressure as, uh, in, in these uh, plastic extrusion cases, as quickly uh, and as efficiently as possible. However, uh, if that quick, uh, that speed kind of takes over the efficient part, uh, the energy use is uh, expended, you're getting quality flux uh, in the actual product, and depending on the polymer, of course, there are different characteristics that can be affected by higher temperatures, lower temperatures. Uh, you know, you're getting into problems with the pressure as uh, the characteristics of the resin change uh, in the barrel. Um, so uh, essentially what we look at uh, in terms of analog control is, from a uh, ramp standpoint, how can we control the, the variables in the environment or affect them in a way that uh, will get to the most efficient point uh, the fastest. So we have things like uh, cutback, overshoot, uh, suppression, uh, gain scheduling, so you can use uh, the same extrusion uh, process with multiple different resins uh, and 
control for that uh, specific type of polymer that you're using, uh, you know, given the, the different uh, tendencies to uh, increase or decrease in temperature or pressure uh, based on the, the characteristics of the material itself, right? So it's, it's very easy, kind of straightforward uh, process automation uh, instead of having to control manually while uh, we're using this, uh, this type of resin, uh, this mix, uh, which you know, equals a, an exchange of temperature. Uh, all that's kind of built in to your control response. And so if we just look at a typical um, PID controller, right? You can have one of these on uh, any single zone. However, uh, the beauty kind of comes in uh, on the connectivity part when you're tying into. So, uh, you know, uh, zone one controller can see what zone uh, 10 controller is doing and therefore uh, improve the feedback response from that, right? So if I'm seeing a huge uncertainty in the system, somehow the resin that I'm dumping into the hopper at this point uh, is a little bit cooler, so it's affecting the temperature response down the line, and therefore the melt pressure of the critical component uh, in actually producing the product, I can you know, build in some feed forward factor to uh, increase the, the output in the you know, forward zones to compensate for that, that change or that error. Um, the other thing involved, right, when we're looking at uh, the different temperature zones, you're, you're generally heating uh, all the time. Sometimes you're cooling, uh, depending on uh, the actual application. Um, and to do that process, you're using a, a most likely a resistive heating product um, to generate that. But there's a, a jacket, like a wrap around the barrel. Uh, obviously, there are different types of um, heating applications you can use, and they're mostly electric, right? I don't think uh, you see too many uh, gas, fire, or other energy source um, used for the heating component. And how that uh, heating component is acted upon, right, how the load changes from your electrical uh, input uh, to that load, right, your, your uh, whatever you're using uh, in terms of power generally, it's going to be a three-phase solution. Uh, uh, think about a, a simple um, hockey puck style SSR, right? It receives a signal, it switches the load. However, of course, with power, there are different uh, dynamics uh, based on uh, you know, AC power, right? So uh, when using SSR, there's no kind of insight into how it's reacting to uh, the, the input that it's given, the current that it's given, uh, and where it, it fires the actual uh, load at that point in time. So what you can see is all these types of electrical harmonics, uh, interference uh, when you're, you're doing these type of applications, which can just be uh, electrically bad for the whole system in general uh, and degrade the components over time. Uh, and generally what you'll see, uh, especially if you're using kind of older style mechanical contactors, is the life expectancy because of the cycle times, they're unable to keep up. Uh, and so the, you know, just the transition and the, um, the renewal process of uh, the degradation of that actual component uh, is a lot faster. So uh, what, uh, what you can do to mitigate those uh, problems is look to an SCR, right? Uh, and, and what you can do there is, of course, uh, different types of firing, whether it's phase or cross firing, now you're starting to work with uh, the tools in the, the power input that you're given, right? You're firing uh, the zero cross point, so your power factor is starting out at a, a lot higher rate. You know, theoretically, it's up at, at one or 100 percent, um, whereas if you're, you're doing that uh, sinusoidal wave, your power factor decreases, which can then incur uh, larger costs from the electrical company, your supplier down the chain. Uh, which there is, there's still some a uh, little bit of, uh, I guess. Depends on the municipality, your location, how the, the power company is uh, working with that. But generally, uh, it's kind of referred to as dirty power, right? So, uh, when using SCR and uh, zero cross firing, you're able to generate uh, not only full or, or better use of energy, uh, which is then equated at the end, of course, uh, to where everyone's looking at, at uh, cost savings uh, from there. So, you can use different terms uh, like load balancing, where you're sharing. Uh, power load between different SCRs that are connected. And again, this goes back to uh, being able to have information uh, from different components in the system, different instrumentation to uh, enact uh, a change uh, on your process. So uh, that kind of leads nicely into uh, leveraging these control components into uh, connecting to each other and the uh, industrial internet of things. I uh, just want to pull out one quote, hopefully you can see it up there. Uh, and it says, global processing industries have reported losing 20 billion US dollars each year, 5% uh, of total production, due to unscheduled downtime. And 80% of those losses are preventable, right? So uh, again, of course, you're pointing to uh, the back end uh, 
cost savings coming out, right? 80% of those losses are preventable, uh, generally due to uh, these diagnostic features such as, right, how much current is my, uh, my heater uh, currently uh, pulling, you know, instead of having the reactive change, oh no, something's broken, you're, you're getting a lot more information as far as uh, when uh, this typical time frame for things breaking or uh, needing uh, refurbishing and things of that nature. Uh, so you're able to tie that data uh, into actionable uh, items Instead of having a full plan shutdown, uh, you're able to kind of plan for a you know, maintenance downtime when production isn't on the line. Right? So this is just a typical look uh, at kind of what the ideal system is. All the components are tied together. You know, you have your your plant network is fully tied into your HVAC system, lighting, water management. Um, that's more on the building side. Uh, and then of course uh, on your process side, you have maybe a PLC network connected to all your you know, extrusion lines in general. Uh, which you want to keep separate, but at the same time, still want to be able to read data uh, so that you can say, hey, uh, you know, when I'm receiving uh, less water, the, the water degradation that's coming into the city is affecting the cooling process at my extrusion plant. How can I compensate for that factor moving forward uh, in, the, in the PLC network in the actual uh, process uh, side of things? Um, and of course, these things can also lead to, right, we're, we're reaching back into uh, the database model and being able to manage the data that's available not only in real time, but moving backwards uh, and, and being able to see, hey, what was going on at this point in time when uh, you know the, the screw cracked, right, or, or something uh, detrimental to the system happened, and you can start to do things like model predictive control. So model predictive control uh, is essentially uh, next level uh, analog control or, or just control in general where you're using constraints to the system and saying, let's try and stretch these constraints or move to a point where we can kind of see what's coming based on the parameters available to us uh, and use those to either change the system control features uh, or react to changes in a different way uh, that might be uh, beneficial to the process. Uh, and of course, uh, having all that data allows you to say, you know, what was going on at this point in time, uh, let's make sure we can mitigate those risks going forward uh, based on this data. And of course, it's, it's the iterative process, right? You make changes, uh, you measure what you're doing uh, at that point in time, you improve the process, something else happens, you add that uh, data set to the model uh, and make changes based on that. Uh, and of course, are uh, able to, as a result of connectivity, right, I can start looking at phone, you know, your, your uh, process solutions person, instead of getting a notification uh, from the plant manager or whatever it is, uh, all this data can be aggregated into a more uh, viewable or uh, user interface uh, capable uh, system uh, or easy dashboard, right, basic dashboard of information. Uh, one, one point I do want to make, uh, of course, as uh, this whole uh, connectivity part comes into play is the security of those systems. Um, and how they're interacting, right? So much uh, more now we see uh, the IT professional or the IT department becoming a stakeholder in these decisions for uh, finding new solutions for the business, whereas before it used to be the plant manager or process manager or, or maintenance manager, whoever it was, the actual uh, people working with the systems themselves. And now the IT person is in the room saying, hey, what's that connected to in my network? And how can we mitigate the risk with, uh, well, if something here is compromised, are they also going to have access to our corporate uh, payment structure, right? Our, um, credit card information that we're sending to all our customers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so, of course, there are different recovery bodies uh, that uh, can be used to audit those uh, features of any systems. Uh, ISA, uh, certainly a good example. Uh, there's a company called World Tech that does Achilles, which is completely around uh, the Ethernet based uh, communication robustness testing. So, uh, certainly a resounding point to bring up as these. Uh, technologies create more capability for connectivity. So, certainly so, so something to be aware of. Um, I, think, I think that's what I have on IoT. Um, so, again, uh, in summary, right, you're set with a uh, mechanical uh, build or design, and from that, uh, essentially, it's your set of constraints. And so, what can we do with those constraints to improve uh, the productivity of that system, the yield, uh, the energy costs, and savings? all of those as well. So, thank you.